everyone. This is Miss Word. A word is a world, so welcome to my world. Today, I'm going to read the Horde: How the Mongols Changed the World by Mary Favaro in 2021. The Mongols are widely known for one thing: conquest. In the first comprehensive history of the Horde. The western portion of the Mongol Empire that arose after the death of Genghis Khan, Mary Favaro shows that the accomplishments of the Mongols extended far beyond war. For three hundred years, the Horde was no less a force in global development than Rome had been. It left behind a profound legacy in Europe, Russia, Central Asia, and the Middle East. Popular to this day, Favaro takes us inside one of the most powerful sources of cross-border interrogations in world history. The Horde was the central node in the Eurasian commercial boom of the 13th and 14th centuries, and was a conduit for exchanges across thousands of miles. Its unique political regime, a complex power-sharing arrangement among the Khan and the nobility, rewarded skillful administrators and diplomats, and fostered an economic order that was mobile, organized, and innovative. From its capital at Sirai on the Lower Volga River. The Horde provided a governance model for Russia, influenced social practice and state structure across Islamic cultures, disseminated sophisticated theories about the natural world, and introduced novel ideas of religious tolerance. The Horde is the eloquent. Ambitious and definitive portrait of an empire little understood and too readily dismissed, challenging conceptions of nomads as peripheral to history. Favaro makes clear that we live in a world inherited from the Mongol moment. Note on the transliteration. This book includes many terms of originating in non-English languages. Most of these terms have numerous acceptable English spellings. I have attempted throughout to prioritize both accuracy and legibility. Spellings of persons' names follow well-established English language forms. The common spelling of Genghis Khan, however, is given. Here, under its historically correct form of Genghis Khan, a usage shared by most historians of the Mongol Empire, I use common Europeanized spellings of titles such as Khalifa and Amir. Place names are also given in co- common Anglicized forms when these are available. I sometimes reference current geographic terms that may appear anachronistic in context. However, these terms are useful for orienting readers and hopefully won't offend specialists. For the spelling of Mongolian terms and names, I largely follow the system employed by Christopher Atwood. In Encyclopedia of Mongolia and Mongol Empire, these spellings are based on the Uyghur Mongolian script, as pronounced in the Mongolian language of the relevant time period. In some cases, however, I use more common forms, and in some cases, Mongolian terms are given in their Turkic. And the Russian forms, in accordance with common usage in the sources and in scholarship.
Arabic words and names have been transliterated according to the system used in the International Journal of Middle East Studies, except that I omit the dot diacritic. In most cases, the transliteration of Persian and Turkic words follows the same simplified system. Russian has been transliterated according according to the system of the Library of Congress, without diacritics. For Chinese names, I have employed the pin-in system. Introduction A power of a new kind. The Horde was neither a conventional empire nor a dynastic state, even less a nation-state. It was a great nomadic regime born from the Mongol expansion of the 13th century, an equestrian regime that became so powerful it ruined virtually all of today's Russia, including western Serbia, for almost three centuries. The Horde was the most enduring regime of all those that descended from the Mongol con- conquerors. Yet, despite the rich evidence we possess about the Horde, it remains little understood. Far more has been written about the Yukanis, the Mongol rulers of the Middle East, and the Yuan the dynasty inaugurated in China by descendants of Genghis Khan. The fascinating tale of the Horde remains as though behind a veil. This book reveals the Horde's story, which begins in the East Asian steppe, where in the early 13th century Genghis Khan united the nomads, Mongols, and the other steppe peoples and began building the largest contiguous empire in the world. Genghis gave four of his sons, each his own, rulers, his own people, and a territory in which to establish themselves. Key to this history is the inheritance to Jaki, Genghis Khan's eldest and chief heir. Jaki was entrusted with the conquest of the steppe west of Mongolia, a vast region that reaches its ecological limits in Hungary. Jaki, however, slighted his father, and Genghis stripped his priority to the throne. The consequences were profound. In the 1240s, after Jockey died, his sons, warriors, and their families moved to the temperate zone between Volga Ura region and the Black Sea, where they established a new kind of Mongol administration, largely independent of the empire. The Jockey pioneers maintained Mongol practices but would never go back to Mongolia. In less than three decades, a few thousand people became hundreds of thousands, creating a sophisticated social organization able to sustain their own imperial formation. This multitude recognized itself as ruleless, Joki and referred to their empire as Alda, the Horde. The Horde was a flexible regime, able to adapt to internal changes and external pressures. The Horde was also wealthy and powerful enough to rule its neighbors and secure autonomy from the Mongol center. Jaket leaders re calibrated relations with the other descendants of 
Genghis to maintain stability, and they kept control of the cities and trade routes between the Aro and the Black Seas, securing critical commercial avenues. Indeed, the Horde dominated Eurasians. Continental trade, and in the process, shaped the trajectories of Russia and Central Asia until the 16th century. Historians know this mighty and influential regime as the Golden Horde or the Chipak Khanate, a reference to the Chipak people. Prior inhabitants of the land, lands of the Horde took over. These scholars increasingly have recognized the Horde's historical significance, and yet rarely have attempted fully to explain it. This book seeks to examine the Horde on its own terms, to grasp how this regime emerged, developed over the centuries. Adjusting and transforming while keeping its nomadic character. Importantly, we need to put native concepts such as rulers, sirai, sedentary cities the nomads built, including a major one called simply sirai, khan ruler and back nomadic leaders, front and center. To explain the horde from within, this book not only captures the obscured social and political nature of the horde, it also reconsiders the horde's legacy, its impact on global history. In the second half of the 13th century, economic exchange intensified, integrating almost all of Eurasia. Today. Most historians have accepted the notion of a Mongol world empire, coalescing in one economic system, the main subsystems of the Eurasian land mass, roughly divided into East Asia, the Islamic world, the Southic world, and Europe, under Mongol domination. Far away religions of the globe came into contact more than superficially, and for at least a century spanning the mid 1200s to the mid 1300s, these regions were linked in a common network of exchange and production. For the first time, people and caravans. Could travel safely from Italy to China. Historians used to call this unprecedented commercial boom Pax Mon- Mongolica, the Mongol Peace, in reference to the post-conquest stability of the Mongol dominance. And the far-flung exchange that stability enabled. Yet, as recent scholarship notes, relations among the descendants of Genghis Khan were not peaceful, nor was there peace. Exactly, between the Mongols and the peoples they conquered, the notion of peace here should be understood more clearly as a conquered people's acceptance of Mongol domination. But we need not discard the concept just because the word peace is not entirely appropriate. Here, I re-examine the Pax Mongolica as the Mongol exchange, a macro historical phenomenon. On part with such world-shaping phenomena as the Trans-Saharan trade or the Colombian exchange, understood as the Mongol exchange, the global moment created by Genghis Khan's successors comes into focus. The Mongol exchange is a monumental shift 
that facilitated the fl- flourishing of art, the development of skilled crafts, and the progress of research in various areas such as botany, medicine, astronomy, measuremental system, and historiography. The increased production and the circulation of manufactured objects, often driven by Mongol leaders themselves, is another major effect of this world phenomenon. Ceramics, manuscripts, textiles, music, poetry, weapons. The Mongols wanted everything to be produced. And distributed inside their t- territories, the Mongols also imported goods and enacted policies to attract traders. The Khans valued merchants, granting them lofty distinctions, legal privilege, and tax exemptions. Nomads invested in travel equipment, weaponry. And fashionable clothing, and they craved furs, leather, and imported luxury fabrics made of silk and cotton. The steppe had its understood social markers, some of which necessitated manu- manufacture and trade. Carrying expensive weapons indicated status. So did wearing jewels, belts, hats, fine robes, and leather boots. High-ranking women had a distinctive way of dressing and wore a conical headdress, kuku, or bota, as a widely recognized symbol of their status. The Mongol fashion. Made an impression on foreign travelers, who noted that many people, even Europeans, wanted to look like them. In some senses, manufactured objects were luxurious for the nomads. Yet, the nomads were not frivolous. Luxuries were vital to the Mongol political economy. Long distance exchange and circulation of manufactured goods were not essential to subsistence, yet they were the backbone of the social order. Mongol economics relied on the circulation of these goods, in particular their redistribution from the Khan to the elites, to the recommend, to the commoners, a system. That simultaneously reinforced social rank, created bonds of dependence, and gave even the least in society a reason to feel invested in the success of the regime. Steppe nomads further understood circulation as a spiritual necessity, sharing wealth. Mo- Mollified the spirits of the dead, the sky, and the earth. Across Eurasia, the Mongols enjoyed clear hegemony over the circulation of goods from the mid 13th until the mid 14th century. And while some of the Mongol regimes faltered in this period, the horde continued to facilitate long distance trade. The Mongols built dense economic connections from the Mediterranean to the Caspian Sea to China. This was due in part to their integrative policies. The Mongols welcomed new subjects into their societies, regardless of those subjects' origins, religious, and ways of life. Even freshly defeated enemies were brought into the fold. The Mongols shrewdly combined state power, over treaties, currency insurance, taxation, 
supervision of roads with liberal exchange policies. Although tributes were a key source of revenue, the Mongols provided tax exemptions in order to encourage commerce. And the Mongols approached the partnerships fluid, fluidly, making alliances on the basis of common interest, rather ethnic or religious affiliation, although they exploited such affiliations as well. In the 1260s, the Jokhid elite even converted and mass to Islam in order to win powerful friends and trading partners in Muslim ruled lands. Burkhan, the Jokhid leader at the time, did not lack true religious conviction, but nor were he and his top advisors blind to the real politic benefits of their decision, and nor did they scorn non-Muslim partners. The Jokhid conversion solidified links between Mongol imperialism and Mulak Egypt. One of many relationships that made the Mongol exchange a global phenomenon. The Jokhids also established trading relations and their trade network at times could reach as far as Flanders. In truth, the Colombian exchange should be seen in part as a legacy of the Mongo exchange. As historians have established that Christopher Columbus was looking for a quicker, safer route to India, possibly after he had heard of Mac Polo's travels to the Mongo imperial center in the Far East. The Mongo exchange on this view is not really a historical turning point from the medieval to the modern, although the Pax Mongolica tends to be perceived this way. Rather, the Mongo exchange transcends the separation between medieval and modern. The Mongo exchange bridges the gap between the ancient world's Silk Road and the modern world's age of exploration, transforming our historical perception of both. We must distinguish between the Mongol exchange and the Mongol empire, as they are not the same thing. Certainly, it is important to note their mutual influence how they produced each other, how they interacted with each other, and how they finally parted ways. As the dynamics and the effects of the Mongol exchange lasted long after the collapse of the empire. One of the remarkable dimensions of the interaction between empire and exchange is that the empire did not disrupt the exchange. The Mongols interfered with the economic organization of their subjects and projected their power further than any other imperial formations of their time. Yet the Mongols understood that control over craft production, currency, traders, harvests, and crops had to be flexible and supple, and respectful of the practices and traditions of dominated peoples. Thus, for instance, when Mongols conquered new territories, they usually minted coins that were familiar to the locals and were easily accepted in existing circuits of exchange. Furthermore, the Mongols did not try to extract a value from a subject, no matter the cost to the subject. That is, the Mongols did not enslave their subjects and work them to death. As much later, colonial regimes in the Atlantic world did. Rather, the goal of Mongol imperial oversight 
and intervention was to motivate and empower subjects to produce and trade across the empire, thereby enriching their Mongol overlords. Why was there no clash between globalization and empire building turning the height of Mongol domination? This is a phenomenon that needs explaining, and I believe the explanation lies in the unique imperial policies of the Mongols. Over the past several decades, scholarship on the Mongols has developed tremendously. Thomas Alson's work is especially important. He was the first to demonstrate that the Mongol Empire must be understood as an integrative system beyond the regional divisions, the Chinese territory, the Middle Eastern territory, the Chipak Steppe, and so on, that formed in the wake of Genghis Khan. Drawing on Alson's work, a new generation of historians has reinterpreted the history and the legacy of the empire, masterfully conducted by Michael Byron, Nicola de Cosmo, Peter Jackson, Hong Dong Kim, Timothy May, David Morgan, and others. New research demonstrates that a holistic view is necessary to understanding the functioning of the Mongol Empire. What happened in Karakorum, the Mongol imperial capital, resonated deeply in Sairai, the jagged capital on the lower Volga River. Readers should not be misled by terms such as capital. These cities were built and favored by the Khans, but the Khans did not live in them except during annual festivals and on other special occasions. As I detail throughout the book, Khans lived on the road, migrating with their, their people and herds. Scholars have begun to sweep away old stereotypes of marauding planters, showing instead that the Mongol Empire was a complex political, social, and economical entity resembling a federation or a commonwealth. Our challenge now is to combine the bird's eye bill with a um, microhistory perspective of Mongol Eurasia. The idea of global microhistory is to connect the local and the world registers in order to deepen our understanding of both. The small scale, the voices of individual people and the senses of their lives provides details that inform worldwide history. The voices of individual people may be hard to track down, especially from early periods. But the task is not impossible, especially when the voices are those of the horde. A well-documented case, if not one that has otherwise received comprehensive treatment. Holism has shown us that the Chinggis Sid empire was full of mutual influences as its various portions shaped each other. But that does not mean the empire was a monolith. Its diversity emerges in microhistorical accounting. The empire fostered several enduring nomadic regimes led by the Jokids. Chagatayas, Ugdays, and Tulis, named for four sons of Genghis Khan. Each of these regimes deserves to be 
studied separately in detail. This study focuses on the jacket regime, the hoard, illuminating its particular implementations of and the departures from Mongol styles of rule and examining the long-standing effect of jacket policies on global history. While well, scholars have recognized that nomads could create complex political structures, scholars also have yet to fully grasp the nomads' level of agency in the Mongol exchange. In particular, the horse impact on Eurasian geopolitics. Large questions remain. In what ways did the Mongols, the horde in particular, shape the world around it? How were the horde and other Mongols shaped by their encounter with the outside world? How were the horde and other Mongols shaped by their encounter with the outside world? How did Mongol rulers adapt their inherited traditions of governance without losing their nomadic and historically anchored identities?